Hello, welcome to Berkshire Guitar Amplifier Repairs. Stuart Smith with you as always, and we have a treat in store for us today because we have a lovely Vox AC10 from the 1960s, completely original, and the customer wants me to give it a look over, see if any uh, valves need changing, if any caps need doing, anything like that. So I think let's, let's not mess around, let's get straight into it and have a look inside this classic amplifier. Here we are, nice view from the front, in quite good condition this, the Tolex looks great and the grill cloth looks original. And along the top we have the standard layout for this amplifier here, vibrato, and quite a simple set of controls there. One volume for the vibrato channel, which the guitar's plugged into at the moment, and one volume for the other channel, the ordinary channel. So let's get the back off and see what it looks like inside. Here we are, top side of this little beauty. So let's just have a little look around it. First thing is to notice that this is uh, quite bent here. And of course this is not easy to repair without uh, taking the whole panel off here. I'm not quite sure what to do about that. I'll leave that for the moment. So the valve lineup, I've just labelled these. So EF86 on the front end, ECF82. These are quite unusual valves these days, not at all common in modern amplifiers. And the ECC83 as a phase splitter. We have a pair of EL84s. Uh, these are mullards, but they will have seen better days, so we'll be revalving this amp. And um, these are not this is a cathode biased amp so we'll have a look at that in a moment don't know if I can get that in one handed maybe not we'll put that in in a minute and then uh, the rectifier is an EZ81 there's no reason to change the rectifier that will almost certainly be okay um, uh, I think we'll probably leave that alone in general, condition is not too bad. Bit of oxidisation on this transformer, but not very much. And a bit on here. Mains transformer, obviously. Output transformer. Choke. Um, yep, that's it really. Let's turn it upside down and have a little look on the underside and see what condition that's in. There are two undersides on this amp. There's that underside and there's this underside. So let's look at this one first, and we have the main filter capacitor. No obvious sign there of leakage. I need to take a view on this amp about how much we do kind of precautionary and how much we leave alone to make it authentic. This will be the cathode bias resistor here with its decoupling capacitor across it. So we definitely will be changing this because this is quite old. And then we will be measuring the voltage across this resistor here with the new valves in to make sure that the new valves aren't pulling too much current. If they are we will have to upgrade that resistor to a higher value. Um, obviously we have these old resistors here. I think we'll go along all those with the meter and just see how out of tolerance they are. Let's spin this around now and have a look at the other, other, other underside. And there we go. Um, looks quite clean actually you know this is a 60s amp I believe and there's nothing no cobwebs no horror stories here we'll obviously service the pots uh, measure some resistor values almost certainly change that electrolytic um, although again there's no sign at all there that that's leaking or has any problems um, and we'll probably change that electrolytic there and that electrolytic there. I'm not going to get involved, I don't think, in changing all these, any of these capacitors here. We want to leave it as, as original as possible, providing it's working, of course. Right, so I think the plan of action is, um, do I have a replacement valve set for this? I know I've got an EF86 
do I have an ECF82? I'm not so sure I have, so let me go and check that. And we might need to order one of those in. OK, I'm going to take an executive decision here. I don't have an ECF82, although I have just put one on order, because it's quite useful to have. So here are the valves that have come out of it. We have a nice Mullard EF86 here. Um, the ECF82 is still in, in the amp. Here's the ECC83, again a nice Mullard. And we have a pair of uh, Mullard EL84s. I'm going to change the power valves because yeah, they've, they haven't been changed in 50 years. And I'm going to leave the preamp valves. And if the amp works OK, we're going to leave well enough alone. There's no point in just swapping those for the sake of it. And they're nice mullard, so let's keep this as original as possible. And also, let's save the customer as much money as possible. Valves are expensive these days uh, due to a worldwide shortage. And you know, these are £15, £16 pounds each, these valves. So £32 pounds immediately, plus another £16, you know, £14, £50 pounds in preamp valves. So if we don't have to change them, uh, let's not. But I will put a new pair of EL... 84s in, and I'll put a pair of JJs in there, because they will have seen better days. I mean, they're, they're mullards and all the mystique of all that, but they they will have definitely seen some action in these valves. You can tell they're looking fairly, fairly tired. So let's get the new power valves in, replace these into the amp, and power it up, and see what it's sounding like, and also let's check that bias current. The amplifier is in and plugged in and on. We're in the vibrato channel. Uh, just because when I plugged into the normal I couldn't hear anything. But let's check the vibrato channel first of all. And uh, we have a bit of vibrato. Very scratchy pot. Seems like turning this clockwise reduces the amplitude. No vibrato there. As we come back this way, it increases. <laughs> How interesting. I haven't worked on an AC10 before. I've worked on lots of old boxes, but not an AC10. Here's the speed. That's working. Nice. And this is the volume. So that's all sounding quite good, actually. Uh, why couldn't I get anything in the normal channel? Oh yeah, it's there now. We'll have a good old tap around inside here as well, just to make sure there's no loose connections. It's, okay, it's oscillating when I turn it up. Hear that squeaking? That's oscillating. I'm not going to worry too much about that at the moment, because the thing's up on the bench, and who knows what's going on really. Uh, it's gone very hummy all of a sudden. Okay, hum goes down when you go into there. Unplug, and it's quite hummy. And it doesn't go away when you plug into there, so not sure what's happening there either. Ooh, that's the normal. Um, Oh yes, I, I know what is happening here. Right, when we're in the vibrato channel, we don't get any um, oscillation. We've got lots of volume, but no oscillation. If I go to the normal channel, leave this channel open, so now we're on this channel, and I turn up the volume here, it, it oscillates, so we just need to turn that. Oh, and that's where that hum's coming from, okay. I forget how these work now, of course. Both of these channels just open, you know, when you go into here it goes through this channel. When you go into here it goes when you go into here it goes through this channel. When you go here it goes this channel. But this channel's still live when you're plugged into here. So you just need to turn down the volume and then uh, go on to this channel here, which is the normal channel. Tone control. Again that's working the opposite way I'd expect. So full treble there full bass there. Uh, that's all um, actually sounding quite good. Now I think we'll just uh, have a look now at the bias current on these two power valves which share a cathode bias resistor. You can't um, bias one of these amps 
uh, with a pot or anything. They have um, a, uh, bi a, a cathode bias resistor in the tail of both of these two, which is a fixed resistor. I'll show you that now. I've covered this in a separate video, but I thought you might just like a quick little look at the difference between what's called fixed bias and what's called cathode bias. So let's talk about fixed bias first of all. Here's our valve look, and uh, it's got basically three electrodes, what's called an anode, a grid, and a cathode. And it's got this little torch bulb heater here, which um, is the thing that you see glowing when you look at a valve. So this heats up, and it heats up this bit of bent metal here, and electrons stream off the metal, kind of boils off trillions of electrons. Now if you take this plate here positive, in other words up to HT, let's say it doesn't really matter what the voltage is, but plus 300 volts, you'll remember from your high school physics that electrons want to, they're negatively charged, they want to rush across to the positive uh, electrode here. So without this grid here, the electrons would stream off this cathode uh, up to the anode don't forget there's a vacuum inside this tube so there are no air molecules to bash into and go up to the HT. So in other words a current would flow through this valve here. Let's take this down to ground. So a current would flow from ground up to positive or if you prefer the other way from positive down to ground it doesn't matter. The, under those circumstances the valve would glow red hot by the way and would probably be destroyed because a very high current would flow. So we want to regulate this current and they do that by putting a kind of mesh grid in here in the valve and they take this electrode here which is called the grid negative with respect to the cathode. So in other words if the cathode is ground this is going to be minus 20 volts or minus 30 volts or something like that. Well how does that work? Well you can imagine look at a little electron here wants to rush across to the tempting positive plate up here but it's repelled by the negative charge on this grid so it kind of turns around and heads back down again and I'm sure you can see that if I made this negative enough no electrons will get through the grid to the anode and so the valve wouldn't conduct any current. Some kind of intermediate negative voltage doesn't really matter what, minus 20 or something some get through, some get repelled and so we have here a, a, a way of kind of turning up and down the, the throttle, if you like, on this, on this valve, uh, adjusting the tick over rate um, of a car, very similar. You know, just a, you adjust the tick over rate of a car to be, to, be to be ticking over at the right kind of level. Similarly with a valve, we adjust this negative voltage here to allow the valve to draw a standard kind of current it's about 35 milliamps of that kind of order. Now, I'm sure you can see that if I set this negative to be, let's call it minus 20, doesn't really matter, and we get our 35 milliamps, we're talking DC now, just a steady state 35 milliamps flowing through here. If I make this a little bit more positive, in other words minus 19 volts, more current will flow. If I make this a little bit more negative, say minus 21 volts, less current will flow. And if I do this kind of thing, more positive, more negative, more positive, more negative, more and less current flows, so the, the current fluctuates through the valve, hence it fluctuates through the primary of the output transformer here. We've now got an AC current going through there, gets coupled to the secondary of the output transformer, and the speaker produces sound. That's how a valve works. It's actually quite a simple device. It's not a lot more complicated than that. So when we talk about bias, how would we want to set this this tick over rate, this 35 milliamps, no AC now, just set the tick over rate so that when we put our AC in it varies around about that tick over rate. And to do that we need to put a fixed negative voltage on this grid here. Now under a fixed bias um, situation we do this by, it doesn't really matter the details, but we can take it to a pot look and uh, the pot goes to, um, if you like, let's make it this a ground at this end and negative 50 volts at that end. So now you can see by winding the pot, we can get minus 50, minus 40, minus 30, minus 20, minus 10, nothing. We can adjust the bias. And this is a typical bias adjustment pot. Sometimes it's done just by two fixed resistors. And this setup here 
is called fixed bias. It's a bit confusing, I think, because actually we're adjusting the bias, but it really means that the bias is, once you've adjusted it, it's fixed. I don't like the terminology, I didn't make it up, that's the way it is. So we set our negative 20 on there, we get a 35 milliamps down here, and then via some other jiggery poke, we, we put our um, AC signal in here and get our AC signal out. Fixed bias. This sort of amplifier has a bias that can be adjusted. So, in other words, it's, it's adjustable, <laughs> even though it's called fixed bias. In contrast, cathode biasing cannot be adjusted. You'll never find a twiddly pot in a uh, cathode biased amplifier. So let's have a look at the same situation again. It's, um, it's pretty much exactly the same, of course, you'd expect it to be. This is our HT, you know, plus 300 volts or whatever. Again, we've got our grid grid here and our cathode which goes through a, a resistor this time. Remember previously it went straight to ground? It goes through a resistor and again of course we put our AC in here at some point but we, we reference this grid now to ground. Normally a sort of fairly high value resistor is put to ground there. So let's put our capacitor in for our AC eventually. Here's our AC but we won't worry about that in a moment. So DC wise now, look, this, this grid is at ground because it has this resistor here. So if we've got a grid at ground, we want that grid to be negative with respect to that. If you remember, it's got to be minus 20 volts with respect to the cathode. Well, if it's at ground, how is it going to get to minus 20 volts? Well, the answer is, of course, if we made this grid positive, like plus 20 volts, like that, then, and this is ground, not volts, with respect to the cathode, the grid is minus 20 volts, I think you'll agree. And so if we could set up this situation where we had plus 20 on the grid, not on the, sorry, plus 20 on the cathode, not on the grid, this valve would again be biased correctly. We'd have our 35 milliamps ticking through it and all would be well. So how can we arrange for this to be at plus 20 volts? Well, the answer is we put a resistor in here. So now look, 35 milliamps through some unknown resistor, Rx, gives 20 volts, well V equals IR, so 20 equals um, 35 times 10 to the minus 3 milliamps um, times uh, R, and if we were to divide 20 by this, I can't do it in my head, we would come out with a value for R. In fact, why don't we just quickly do that? I haven't intended to do that, but why don't we do that? Right, I've just done the calculation. 20 upon 35 times 10 to the 3 is about 570 ohms. So if we put a 560 ohm resistor in there, of a decent wattage, then when 35 milliamps flows through there, 20 volts will be developed across it and the, and the um, valve will be correctly biased. Now what's clever about this is it's kind of self-regulating because let's look what happens if the current increases. Don't worry about why it would increase. Let's say you know, the current goes up a lot higher. Well, more current's flowing through here now. More voltage is developed across this resistor. This goes up to 30 volts or something. Now the grid is minus 30 compared to there, and so the valve will be turned off. Similarly, if less current flows through here, if the current goes down to 10 milliamps or something, um, then only, say, 10 volts will be developed across here, and so the grid will only be minus 10 with respect to the cathode, and so more current will flow. So I think you see you've got, putting this resistor in here has a kind of self um, a thermostatic you know, regulation. It has a kind of auto-regulation thing, such that the current cannot vary much from 35 milliamps without either turning the valve on a bit more or turning the valve off a bit more. So this is quite a clever auto biasing, if you like. I prefer to call I would I would prefer to call this adjustable bias, and I prefer to call this automatic bias. But you know, wasting my time <laughs> um, on that one now. Okay, so now very briefly, the disadvantage of this is is that we've we've lost 20 volts or whatever of plate to cathode voltage. In other words, less voltage across the valve, which means it can develop less power and also all the current that the valve is going through this resistor and this can get pretty hot so you need a um, high wattage resistor in there and so this arrangement is often reserved for lower power amplifiers you'll often see el84s here but you'll never see well never 
is a big word. You'll never see AL34s or 6L6 GC. I don't think I've seen an AL34 or a 6L6 cathode biased amplifier just because too much current goes through. This gets too hot and you lose too much power over here. Now I've simplified this of course and the previous one because we don't normally have one valve we have two doing a kind of push-pull arrangement, but that, that would overcomplicate it. And for what, what we need, this is exactly what's going on inside the amplifier. Right, so you need a heftier resistor here. And more importantly, you can bypass this resistor with a capacitor, quite a big capacitor like this. And that means that as far as AC is concerned, this is a short circuit, this resistor, because the capacitor looks like a short circuit to AC. Therefore, you can get more AC voltage swing developing across the primary. Well, that's probably enough for you to uh, be going on with. I hope you enjoyed that. It's a, it's a um, confusing subject, one I've covered several times, but hopefully you're a little bit wiser now. So let's get back to the amp and see this cathode biasing in practice. Here is the cathode bias resistor here, with its associated cathode bias capacitor. This makes that resistor look like a short circuit to, to AC. But on DC, this sets the bias current flowing through the two valves. It's 130 ohms. I've got the meter clipped across it and it's reading, amazingly, you know, 130 ohms, 127.8, so that's fine. Uh, what's the voltage across it though? So we'll set the meter to volts and turn on the amp and we can measure Using Ohm's law, we're going to be able to measure the current going through the valve pair. So we'll just let it settle. 10, 10 call it 10 volts, I think, so we'll put this down to 20. Yep, 10.3 volts. Right, so we need to do a bit of Ohm's law now, so let's do that. Right, here's the setup, here's one EL84 about 300 volts on the plate and it goes through this cathode resistor which it shares with the other EL84 so both of the currents go through here currently 130 ohms and here's the bypass capacitor that gets rid of all the AC down to ground we've got about 10 volts across here look and using Ohm's law I equals V upon R our V is 10.3 volts and our R is 130 ohms the V upon R gives you about 79, about 80 milliamps down through this resistor, which means that 40 milliamps per valve bias current is flowing. Now that's hot. If I do the calculations, it should be about 30 milliamps. And that's assuming a plate voltage of 290 volts. In other words, that's the voltage across the valve here, 300 less 10. So with a plate voltage of 290 volts, 30 milliamps is about right. So this is running hot. Now I know a lot of amps do like to run EL84 is very hot, but my view is that this is a little bit too hot. And uh, if we look at these old valves, I think they have been running a little bit hot, but also a lot depends on the valve. When you change the valve, you do change the bias, obviously. So um, I can either start messing around with this resistor um, or I can see if I can find another pair of valves which are a little bit cooler. Um, I think that might be a little bit difficult. Or maybe I'll have a quick look to see if I've got anything on the cool side. I did manage to find a pair which were cooler than the first pair I put in, but as you can see it hasn't made a significant difference to the current. It's gone down by maybe 0.2 of a volt or something, which doesn't equate to very much. Maybe we've lost a milliamp, so we're not going to be able to tame this by valve selection. So I think I'm going to change this resistor here for something a bit larger and uh, just reduce this current. I, I don't like running these at 40 milliamps, it's just a way too hot really. Well I got lucky first time really, I've cut one end of that resistor off and brought it out on some crock clips to a 47 ohm 10 watt on the bench there. So I'm putting 47 ohms in series with 130 basically and uh, that makes 177 ohms and then measuring across that look I've got 11.1 volts call it 11 volts so 11 volts upon 177 is 62 milliamps which is 31 milliamps per 
valve and I'm happier with that than I am with 40 milliamps per valve. So I'm going to put that resistor in and that has the advantage of, uh, if I can find a spot for it of course, it has the advantage of retaining the existing resistor so that if anybody in the future wants to restore this amp to exactly as it was, they've got the original resistor there and they can just remove my modification resistor. So that's the job to do, let's get on with that. There's the 47 ohm 10 watt which I've put in series with this existing one and I've also changed the bypass capacitor it was uh, what are we, 50 microfarads at 50 volts that's 100 microfarads at 100 volts so that's a better capacitor and smaller of course with 50 years of technology and this is now quite old this capacitor still works but uh, best to have a new one in there. Right, we're going to power it up again, just make sure it all works after that, and then think what we're going to do next. Yes, that all works, and funnily enough, the next thing I'm going to do is to replace this mains plug. Every time I touch it in the socket, the power comes and goes, so there's something dodgy about it, and it's now non-standard in the UK anyway, because this, these plugs need to have a shroud, plastic shroud, halfway up the pin there, leaving just that tip exposed. That's so that when you pull the plug out, you can't get your fingers round and uh, touch the terminals as you're pulling it out. So I'm going to change that plug, and that'll keep me happy. Here's the new plug, and you can clearly see those plastic shrouds that go halfway up the pin there. I've removed the standard 13 amp fuse, which comes with these plugs. Those are good for electric kettles and electric fires and that sort of thing. And instead we're going to put a 3 amp fuse in place of it. Don't forget the purpose of the fuse is to break under fault conditions. So in other words, if live ever becomes shorted to ground in the amplifier, for example, a large current would flow and it would blow that fuse and you don't want too much current to flow. It very much depends on the appliance. So if you've got a fairly low current appliance, you just want a low value fuse in there so that it blows quite quickly. You don't want it pulling 13 amps before and smoking, you know, before it blows the fuse. So only use 13 amp fuses in high power appliances. Three amps is more than enough for this amplifier. So we'll pop that in and we'll get that on the end of the lead and uh, then we're good to go again. Radio, we're legal again. We have a decent plug on there. So let's plug that in and make sure that works. Yeah, lights on. And that'll be a bit more stable now. Every time I touch that other lead, the power dipped on this, so there was obviously a problem there. Okay, so we're making a bit of progress. I'm not going to change this filter cap here. It's showing no signs of leaking. There's no serious hum on the amp and uh, that proves that the filter valve, the filter cap is working fine. I don't like doing unnecessary work on an amp. I like to leave it as original as possible. And there's no real downside to this. You know, if that filter cap ever goes, the customer will just hear a loud hum on the amp. There won't be any damage done and he can bring it to me and we'll change it, but I bet that's good for another 10 or 20 years. And of course, as I always say, it's all money, 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 money. The bill can go up and up and up on an amp like this, ending up in hundreds of pounds, and uh, I don't want to be charging the customer that. Okay, next thing I'm going to do is, I think, service the pots whilst I remember. So I'll do that, and then I'm going to change these two electrolytic capacitors, this one and that one. Uh, just because they are now quite old. I'll probably also change... I may change this one, I may not. I'll have a little think about that. So let's get the amp in a position where we can see this side of the chassis. A great thing about these older amps is you can actually get the nozzle spray in. <laughs> they have these nice big pots. So a little bit of deoxit in each of these. And that gives them a bit of a waggle. And that should 
make things a lot less crackly. So that's one, another job done. Right, next I think I will just change these two capacitors here. Get that out of the way. The existing caps are 25 microfarads, that's 12 volts, interestingly enough, quite a low voltage. These are 25 at 25 volts, so double the voltage and uh, two thirds the size. <laughs> so anyway, we'll pop those in there. That won't take too long. I won't uh, waste your time by watching me solder those in. Right, both of those caps changed. Fairly straightforward. I've had a good look at this cap and it's perfectly all right. There's not any sign of bulging and no leakage whatsoever. And it's obviously working because the amp's working fine and there's no hum. Uh, this is the preamp decoupling capacitor for a couple of stages of HT. I see no point in changing it. It's extra money, extra time. And uh, again, if it goes wrong, it's a fairly straightforward job that we can do at that time, and that time will probably be 10 or 20 years in the future. Uh, I know people watching this have different views, and I always get emails from people saying, just change them all, Stu, why don't you just rip them all out and put new ones in? And the there are two answers, really. One is I like to leave things as authentic as possible, and the other answer is money, as I've said a couple of times before. The bill just goes up and up and up and up and up as you start changing changing things so uh, that's something I like to try to avoid if I can good so next thing I'm going to do is just go along some of these resistors and see if uh, some of them are like miles out of tolerance these are quite old resistors now but of course we don't want to get involved in um, changing these if we can help it or at least too many of them so let me just go along now and have a look see what's going on there now, to do this, I'm going to use my um, Hi-Okai auto-ranging multimeter, which I bought uh, oh, about a year ago. Quite expensive, um, but it means you don't have to change the range. It'll just uh, pick up anything. You can literally go along a load of resistors and, uh, and check them. So let's have a go at that now. So we just go along here, um, 15K. 17k. Old resistors tend to read high. Um, 150k. Interesting. Can't read anything on that. 150k. Oh yeah. No, come on. Come on. That's interesting. That can't be open circuit, surely. Very interesting. Okay, let's carry on. Um, three something, three hundred seventy k, three hundred eighty k. Yep, three thirty k, three hundred k, one meg, one point one meg. Uh, another meg, one meg there, one point two meg. Right, well, um, the weird thing is this resistor here does seem to be open circuit. Uh, when I put the meter on it, I've tried my other meter now, just in case it's a... We're getting, you know, 3.8 meg there on a an open circuit on that way around. So that 150k resistor, let's see if I can get right on the resistor body. Ah, no, no, that's still 12 meg. That resistor seems to be open circuit, which is, a, I'll tell you why I'm sounding surprised, because the amp is working perfectly. So I wonder what that resistor is actually doing. I might go and see if I can find, uh, find that 150k resistor. I think it's the only 150k resistor here. I'm just going to have a quick look at the circuit and see if I can see. Where is it going to? It's going to an orange wire, which is going to one of the preamp valves. So um, 
yeah, it's, it's almost in the first stage. Here's the input, so it's in the first stage somewhere. I'm just going to have a look at the schematic, see where that 150k resistor is. I've lifted one end of this 150k resistor so that I can measure it properly, and it measures over a meg, so that resistor has gone faulty. That is in the vibrato amplitude part of the circuit, so maybe that was why that amplitude pot was a bit weird. Anyway, we're going to replace that one, and uh, then I think I'll power up the amp again and see what it's doing. Right, I've replaced that resistor. I'm not sure it's done much actually, but anyway, so here's the vibrato. That's on full vibrato. That's quite nice, isn't it? As I turn it up, it goes down to lower levels. This is the vibrato amplitude I'm changing here. Now notice as I go close to zero, have a listen to this. Hear all that racket? As we go close to zero, that's not a dirty pot. I've cleaned the pot several times. That's DC on the pot. Now if we measure on that pot, we do actually indeed have 18 volts DC on that side on uh, one side of the pot. I'll just zoom out a little bit so you can see that. So we've got about 18 volts on one side of that. Now every time you put DC on a pot, whenever you turn the pot, you're going to get a horrible um, AC noise coming through. Now have a quick look at this schematic here. I'm not quite sure what they've done here, but um, anyway, this is the pot of interest here, this vibrato amplitude. And uh, you can see that this goes up to HT, look, 255 volts via this 750K resistor, via this 150K resistor to the top of the pot. And this is where we're measuring our 17 volts or whatever. Having DC on that side of the pot means when you adjust this, you're going to put AC noise into the, into the grid here and affect the signal coming out here with noise. Now, there's nothing I can do about that. That seems to be... Um, a feature of this amp or uh, it's certainly designed in that way there, there is DC on that pot and whenever you have DC on a pot you're in trouble really so not much I can do about that you have a horrible kind of um, noise when you turn it down if anyone watching this thinks they know better than that um, and I mean that genuinely I'd like you to tell me because um, it doesn't seem to be good design to have that DC going on there. But anyway, it's all working nicely. Lovely vibrato. Speed's working fine. Um, I'm now going to go to the client and tell him what I've done and tell him what the bill is and say to him, basically it's all working, it sounds good. A lot of these resistors are out of tolerance and we could get involved in a whole new, a whole other round of... Um, expenditure if he wants. There's the clean channel. Oops. Sounds great. This is a lovely sounding amp. Like the sound of that. Um, and ask him Does he want to spend a lot more money or is he happy to take it as it is? A lot depends on what his plans are for the amp, you see. He might be wanting to sell it, he might be wanting to just play it now and then in his bedroom, uh, he might want it restored to perfect tip-top working order, showroom new sort of thing, and uh, it very much depends on the customer what they want to do. So the next thing is to contact him and I'll report back to you with his wishes and since I just merely live to obey that is what I will be doing. Well there you go I hope you enjoyed that one I certainly did I love working on these old amplifiers uh, in the end the customer decided to take it as it was after the work I did and not to get involved in changing all the out of tolerance resistors and that sort of thing. I think that's a wise decision. Do what's needed to get the amp going and keep it running, but don't completely cannibalise the thing 
and turn it into a different amplifier. So that's it from me today. Thanks as always for watching. I'll catch you on the next video.